Sounds good? <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, so first and foremost, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. I, like you said, I'm Dr. Eddie Howard. And I've had 25 years or so in higher ed. And uh, that experience of working at six different campuses has really helped me to figure out and hone my skills and help to make the best experience for me possible. So by show of hands real quick, or just show me a thumbs up, how many folks this is your first kid going to college? One, okay, good, good, okay. All right, so that's great. Uh, what it is about that is there are some things, some tricks of the trade that you wanna learn. Do we have anybody on the call who's had, this, this is the second, a third tour of duty when it comes to kids uh, going to college? Anybody that's had that experience? All right, I got one down there. Okay, good, 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 good. So the folks, there are a couple of people on the call who's, um, this is their first experience of having a kid go to college and some folks that they have, you know, had multiple kids go. So I have four kids and I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. And uh, my four kids going to college has always been an experience, even though I work at the university, I've only worked at the university. And I, my wife says a lot of times, these are the only skills I have. And so as a result of that, I've learned a lot of stuff along the way. Um, prior to coming to Northern Kentucky, I spent a good bit of my life in Augusta, Georgia. Anybody know anything about Augusta? No? Okay, so Augusta is really known for two things. And generally what I ask people is to tell me what the two things Augusta is known for. You can throw it in the chat if you want to. Anybody? Brother, help me out. Is it anything in the chat? Yeah, I saw um, golf come through on. Golf. There you go. There you go. That little golf tournament called the Masters. You've heard that. You've heard of that before, right? Everyone knows the Masters. The Masters golf tournament is so important to the city of Augusta. Do you know that one week within the state of Georgia, you can rent your house out to other folks to to stay? And I guess what week that is? Masters week. People would make tons of money renting their house out for the week of masters. My house was never clean enough because I got four kids, like I said. So I never got a chance to do that. But in any case, what's the other thing that Augusta's known for? Any other guesses, Britta? Not yet. Not yet? I was waiting to see if somebody would, you know, Google and come up with something. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let you off the hook. James Brown. Did y'all know that James Brown was from Augusta? A lot of people didn't know that, right? James Brown and Augusta wasn't really a happy marriage anyway. They kind of like, they kind of ran into each other a lot and caused each other issues. But James Brown had a song that most people know, right? And if I say this, I'm gonna ask someone to come off mute and tell me, when I say this, I'm gonna say, James Brown had a song that says, I feel, there you go. I, I just saw some lips move there. And it says, I feel good. So what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff. And every now and then, I'm going to ask you how you feel. And I'm going to want you to text it. I mean, I want you to put it in a, a shout out. I feel good. So I, that way I'll know that the information that I'm telling you is going to be good information. How's that sound? Sound good? Good. <laughs> All right. So first and foremost, my division. As Division of Student Affairs, I'm responsible for a variety of things. One of the things I'm responsible for is the student for our student conduct office. Um, and within the student conduct office, we provide what we call a community care approach, a community care team. And yes, I'm responsible for making sure that students follow all of the student code of conduct rules and regulations. And I would encourage you to have a conversation with your students about that our student code of conduct and what's important there and what's important for them to know. In addition, we provide within that process, sometimes we find out things about students that we didn't know, like they need assistance or they need help, or there's something behind the behavior that's been exhibited. And that's where our community care team comes into play, okay? Um, the other piece is we also have a variety of students that uh, attend college and they have kids. And so we have a program called Parents Attending College where we have a variety of resources for students. We connect student parents with other students with kids and we, they become kind of a resource for each other. And we have a variety of resources for students um, that may need some assistance. And sometimes that's financial. 
Sometimes it's just not a location, but it's sometimes we provide scholarship opportunities there as well. In addition, we provide engagement opportunities. And that's where my, my work comes in, is to create this engagement opportunity for our students. Within our student engagement area, we have our university housing. And just by thumbs up, how many folks have people that are living on campus? Anybody have students living on campus? Good. I think that's a really good experience for them. It's really helpful to help them to, to know how to navigate on campus. They're not navigating, trying to drive to campus and trying to find their way um, to their particular classroom. They're already here. They can take advantage of opportunities. And that's a really great thing if you have the ability to do it. Um, in addition, we also have campus recreation and our campus recreation program provides an opportunity for students to have that outlet for them to be able to connect for them to be able to work out. We have a variety. If you haven't had a chance to come to campus and look at our facility, I would encourage you to do that. You'll be really impressed uh, with our aquatics area, with our, 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 our recreation area, with the variety of classes that we offer. And, and I think it's really, it helps the students to, like I said, when they go to campus and they have things going on, to let off some stress by going to one of our classes. They can do our spinning classes, our aerobics courses, and they can also work out on our cardiovascular equipment as well. Within our student union building, we have a variety of, 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 of places where students can um, interact with each other. Our full on food court is there with a variety of food options for our students. Once you come to campus, you'll get a chance to see those. And it's also our laboratory for all of the programs and activities that we offer. A lot of great programs and activities happen within that particular space. And it's important for our students to know when those activities come along. My division will be printing what we call a divisional calendar. We'll capture all of the activities that we have on campus. And in some situations, your students have already paid for those with their tuition. So that's their path. That's their passport to some of the great activities that we offer our lecture series. And I really would encourage you to encourage them to try it out, even though um, it may be something they're not interested in or something they've never seen before, to try it out for the first time. In addition, we have fraternity and sororities uh, on our campus and, and the Greek life experience can be something for students that they can really benefit from. Um, and so in the first couple of weeks, you'll hear about our recruitment program and the way students can get involved. There may be a small fee for participation that students will have to pay initially, but I really would encourage you to um, have your students check that out. That's a really good way for them to connect and, and, and meet other students. And then finally, we have over 200 student organizations on campus. If fraternity and sororities are not something the student's interested in, they may find um, interest in some civic organization, department organization, professional organizations, or as well as our honor society, societies that exist on campus as well. Okay, how you feel? Good. Good, all right. <laughs> we also have support services for our students. Um, you know, our, our support services, range from our counseling services. And this year we are going to waive all of our uh, fees to see our student, our counselors and our counseling center. Use it as a $15 per session fee that we charge uh, for folks to come to our counseling center. But this year there will be no cost. We understand the importance um, of mental health and making sure our students have access to our counseling. And we're gonna be looking at expanding counseling services overall. So I would encourage you to have your students ha have a conversation with students about some of the services that we offer. Our wellness center is also housed in the same location as our counseling services. And I know sometimes 18 to 19 to 20 year olds feel like they're invincible. They never get sick. They never have any issues. Uh, but that's what our, our, our health center is there for. If they have a little cough or don't feel as well or having a headache, we really want you to go have them go by the, and have, let someone check it out. Um, and then that way it didn't turn into something really, really major and they're not out of class for several weeks. So I really would encourage you to have your students uh, stop by and use those services um, when they need to. If there's an opportunity to engage your, your personal insurance, they'll let the students know in advance. Sound good? Yep. So, so as I move forward, I wanna talk a little bit about our student accessibility office. And so those of you that might have a student that have a 504 or some type of uh, disability of some sort. Um, that office is uniquely designed to assist students that may be coming from high school with, with some type of accommodation. I would encourage you to have a conversation with our uh, students accessibilities office and, and directly have a conversation with Cindy Knox, who's our director. She can help to navigate those. Uh, we also have students that have physical disabilities or maybe even a temporary disability. 
where you know they've had surgery and they have they're not able to use a hand or something like that there are ways that we can assist the student in the classroom if they need to have those services but they have to let us know so we can assist them okay so how do you feel Very good. Good. all right the north violence prevention center also provides support for students uh, if they've experience some type of sexual trauma. We do a lot of education around that. We do a lot of education around making sure students understand the rules of engagement when it comes to sexual assault and prevention. And we also have an upward bound program that's unique that works with our high school students that really helps with the transition. Some of these are first generation students and some of these students are transition into the university. Not sometimes, not always with us, but they transfer into a post-secondary educational process. Then we also have responsibility for our, what I really enjoy talking about is our Center for Student Inclusiveness. And that office provides direct support for students that we consider to be marginalized populations, our African-American students, our Latinx students, and our LGBTQ community. Our, pro, that, our center is designed to provide additional support and mentoring for those populations, as well as helping all students understand the importance of diversity and inclusion overall. So we work hand in hand with our chief diversity officer to ensure that every student has a really great experience and really have this level of understanding. So when they walk across that stage, we've taught them the importance of diversity and inclusion and the connection that's important for them to have. All right. How you feel? Good. Good. Yeah. And lastly, I'm responsible for campus police, right? I go from student conduct to campus police. I'm responsible for campus police and our campus police exercise what I like to call uh, community policing. They provide an opportunity for students to connect with them, but they're not security guards. They're full-time police officers, right? So part of the thing I also talk about when I talk with you is I talk about my relationship with my grandmother. My grandmother was very important in my life. She was extremely important. She always gave me great advice. So I'm going to give you a piece of advice that my grandmother gave me. One thing my grandmother said, if they have a badge and a gun, you do what they say. <laughs> so I would encourage you to have a conversation with your students about making sure that if they engage with our campus police, if they say, hey, we need you to get out your car, we need you to exit the building, they're dealing with really serious matters. It's important for students to understand they should follow their lead. Sound good? How you feel? Good. Yeah. Good. So next, what I want to really, what I generally do at this time is I generally talk about a pledge, right? I generally have you guys pledge. If you were face to face, I would ask you to, to say this pledge for me, but I'm just gonna recite it and I'm not gonna ask you to say it along with me. But along, what I generally ask people to do is I want you to try to collect as much information as you can throughout the day so you can share with your students um, as you talk with them later on, right? That's your pledge. I want you to make sure that there's a connection there um, and there may be information. There are gonna be people you'll meet today that you need to interact with later, right? So write down Eddie Howard. He's the Vice President of Student Affairs. This guy talked about all the things that we do on campus to support you. So make sure that if you need him, reach out to him, right? Um, reach out to other folks, like Britta's around. She talked about if she can't, she didn't know exactly what a point of student, she'll put him in the right direction, right? That's the type of experience we want our students to have going forward. Sound good? Good. All right. So one of the things that I like to talk about is there are a variety of things that you have done as parents and support folks to get our students where they are, right? And I'm going to tell you this, everything that you've done so far are the things that you continue, you need to continue to do, right? I've raised four kids myself and I raised, I didn't raise all of them the same way. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but our process as we help work to help our, to help our students navigate through the process, it's important for you to understand that this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? And if any of you have ever seen a marathon run, how many by, by thumbs up have seen a marathon? Most people, right? So within the marathon, there are a variety of things that happen in that marathon process. First of all, the first thing you'll see in a marathon is there are people who will run a marathon really quickly with no issues. They need no help, right? They go right from the beginning and right to the finish line. Sometimes I don't really like those people because <laughs> they're just they're so good at running marathons, right? They have no problem. We're going to have students. They're going to come to the university and they're going to succeed without any assistance at all, right? And that's great. And we hope that a lot of our students have that experience. But we also know that there are folks that need to be encouraged along the way. 
And if you've seen a marathon, you've seen people encourage other people, like, you know, cheering them on or slapping them on the hand and say, and our students are going to need encouragement. We're going to be there to encourage your student along the way to help them get there. In addition, you've seen people that may have, that need to be picked up, right? They may fall on the way. And in that marathon, someone there, they may have a leg injury or something like that, and they catch a cramp, they go to the side, someone helps them, and they help them back in the game. Our goal is to help your students when they fall, right? In addition, you may see that there are folks that need to actually physically be carried. You've seen people that get to the line, you just need to carry them across the line because they just physically can't make it. And we're going to be there to help to carry our students, right? We also have students that just need a little bit of help. They're running the race, but they need a little bit of energy. You've seen people along the race line that they've, they've gotten, hey, we give them some water, they take the water, they run, and they keep running the race. That's the type of assistance that we're going to provide. You've also seen students give everything they got, right? In a marathon, they've given all their energy, and when they get to the finish line, they just collapse. We're going to have some students that are going to give their all. And we're going to be there right along the way to help pick them up as they reach their goal. Because that's what it's about, right? We want everybody to finish. And it's our plan is to help them figure out how they finish. Okay? How you feel? Good. Good. So this is what I want to promise to you, right? That as students come back, we know they're going to be anxious. We know there are going to be things that they, they haven't seen before with COVID and all the restrictions. We just started a brand new mask mandate, right? So these will be things that they're going to be have a little bit of trepidation about coming back to campus. But what I want to tell you is this, that we have talented faculty who are experts in their field. And they're going to have an excellent opportunity to come here and they're going to have an excellent education as a result of the educational experience that we provide because academic success is at the forefront of what we do. They're going to have supportive staff who will provide co-curricular experiences and activities and services for them to keep them engaged when they get here. And we also are going to have excellent student leaders who are going to be mentors and show them along the way, right? So there's no need for them to be concerned. So, but I do have some tips for you. And these are just what I call the Howard tips. One is I would encourage your student if you have, if you haven't already done so to get vaccinated, largely because we have a lot of students that will be on campus in the fall. And this will really help us. We'll probably be rolling out some information pretty soon about vaccination and, and probably some vaccination clinics here on campus. I would also ask you to check in with your student. Remember what we talked about, the things that you've done now to get people to this point or the things you're going to have to continue to do. So don't, if you thought your work was over, I'm sorry to tell you that it's not because we're still going to need you to help to get them across the line, right? So check in with them often. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them how things are, are going in the first couple of weeks. I would say this, allow them to try to solve the problems first on their own and then intervene. I'll say that because I have a daughter, right? I have four kids, but my oldest daughter, there's something about her that my wife says, won't you just let her do things on her own? I'm like, no, I have to get involved. I have to help her. Um, and you got some that are just that way that you're going to have to help, right? Because, because that's, you just think that that's what they need. But allow us to allow them to try it on their own. And if it doesn't work, call, because that's what I do. <laughs> Every now and then, if I can't get it done, then I'll call some folks because sometimes it takes the person with a little bit of gray on their head to get the problem solved for a student. We want you. Our goal is to do everything we can to make sure they have a really good experience, but every now and then we may, we may fail at something. So it's important for you to know that you need to remind us, hey, we need to help. We need to have your help with this particular thing. I also would encourage them to check their email weekly. Um, and then if not, have them forward it to you. Now we do a lot of stuff. We send out a lot of information, but we don't put it on TikTok and we don't put it on Instagram and we don't put it on Facebook, right? So. The really important information is in their email. And our open rate sometimes for students is very low. We really want to make sure that students understand the important matters, and it's important for them to check their email weekly. In addition, we also want them to know how important the academic calendar is in regards to making sure if they that phone that they have in their hand is like a little computer right now. So it has everything they need to know. They can make sure they, they need to plan their day and put their schedule in there, put due dates in there, 
uh, of, of when assignments are due, pull out their syllabus and make sure they're following those types of things. All those are really great tools to help them be successful. And then encourage them. This is really, really important because this, this helps me to keep my job, right? Really encourage them to meet new people and try new things. That's really critical. And that's really going to help them connect and bond with the institution. How you feel? Good. So like I told you, I have four kids and I didn't raise all four of my kids the same. Now, my oldest son, I could say to him, hey, don't do that. And I could shake my finger and he really would just fall right back in place. I call that the gentle touch. So I used the gentle touch with him and it worked. Right. Well, then I got another son that the gentle touch really didn't work for him. It really took me kind of grabbing him by the shoulder and kind of shaking and looking at him straight in the face and say, hey, I need you to do this for me. And that's what it would take for him. I call that the shove. So now I've had the gentle touch didn't work. And when the shove didn't work, my youngest, I had to use something a little bit more, you know, creative. So I'd say, hey, don't do that. And that wouldn't work. I said, hey, don't do that. And that wouldn't work. The only thing that worked for her is a two before side the head. But it worked <laughs> every time. But pow, I need you to listen to what I'm saying do here, right? I don't know what it takes for your son or daughter, but you know what it takes, right? You know what it took to get them where they are. If it took the gentle touch, then how does that work? How does that manifest itself in what I'm talking about today? Hey, Eric, did you get that project done? You just want to just want to remind you, did you get that project done that was supposed to get done? Eric, did you get the project done I was asking you to get done? Eric, did I tell you to get the project done? Right? Whatever approach it might take to get them there, that's the approach you need to take, right? Because we're not going to know that. But we really want to make sure that you understand the importance of you continuing to motivate and push them to get them where they need to be. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about my grandmother, right? If I had the ability to, to kind of put grandmothers in like a bottle and like sell them for their advice, I would do it in a heartbeat because I think grandmothers give great advice. And I want to give you the, the advice my grandmother gave me. My grandma was so involved in my life uh, as a college student that she literally wrote to, with me the day I moved in, two and a half hours <laughs> she wrote with me to college. So when I got there, uh, I'm getting out of the car, I'm pulling out of my stuff, I'm getting it all packed up, and my grandmother looks me dead in the face and she says, hey, I said, yes, ma'am, because you always said yes, ma'am to my grandmother. Uh, there was never any way not to say yes, ma'am. And she said, keep your hands to yourself, don't take nothing that don't belong to you, and keep your eyes on your own paper. And I said, yes, ma'am. That worked really well for me. It helped me to get where I am today. And that's the piece of advice I would give to your son or daughter. Keep your hands to yourself. And really, to be honest with you, that means a lot more than just what you think it means, right? Don't take nothing that don't belong to you and keep your eyes on your own paper. If they can do that, they'll have a great experience here at NKU. And that's really my time. So thank you so much. And I, my last question is, how you feel? Good. <laughs> Man, I just had, are there any questions? we got a few minutes. Is there any questions that you might have? No. Did I do okay? I didn't mess you up too bad, did I? No. Awesome. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. And Britta, I appreciate it. I'm going to stop sharing right now. If there's anything I can do for you guys, if you have an opportunity to come to campus, I'm right here in the Lucas building on the eighth floor. Um, if you have an issue, make sure you follow up with anyone in my office, just say Dr. Howard or Eddie Howard or whatever. Um, I'm sure they'll be able to find me. And I really, really appreciate the time I had to spend with you today. If there's something I can do to help, please feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Howard. I did put his email address in the chat box. So if you want to hold on to that, that is a good resource to have available to you. Um, and I will also say that it's the email address that was on um, the reminder, parents at nku.edu. That comes directly to me and I check that every day. So if you lose Dr. Howard's email and you really want to get in contact with him, you can start at that parent's email address and I'll, um, I'll get you connected. 
All right, I'm gonna go, Brenna, thank you. Thank you. So we have a few minutes before our next presenter logs on um, and she is gonna talk to you all about taking care of business. So um, kind of going over the student account information, financial aid, that sort of thing. So if you wanna stretch your arms out or grab something to drink or whatever you need to do, we'll get her in here and situated so that she can get her presentation ready to go. Um, I will then present after her. And if you have any questions about what college session you should attend after my presentation, you can, um, you can write that in the chat and I can look it up and let you know what college your student participated in when they came through orientation. So happy to help that way. Um, again, uh, stretch it out and then give us just a second and we'll get going here at 4.30. Hi, Jill. Yep, your student would be with the Arts and Sciences presentation. I know it's kind of confusing because our students and families normally um, really know what the major is and not the college. And so I know that can be tricky. So if anybody wants information about that, just let me know. Bring me a water of that, will you? All right, Trina, you should be able to share your screen and you can get started whenever you're ready. Share your screen for what? Good afternoon, everyone. Just gonna yeah. get set up. Um, thank you uh, for your time this evening. I am here to present to you on behalf of the offices of Student Financial Assistance and Student Account Services. And so our offices um, uh, essentially uh, are uh, a part of the university to assist your student with uh, the process for, you know, uh, paying, financing their education and paying the bill. So my presentation will cover, um, do an overview of some of the questions that you may have in regards to, the, to those processes. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and go through the presentation and I'll try to reserve time at the end for questions um, because I am sharing my presentation with you. Um, I am unable to um, see the chat at the same time, but I do believe that Rita is on hand and she may she'll be answering um, some questions um, in the chat as they come up. 
um, but we will also um, try to save uh, reserve time at the end uh, of our session to answer any outstanding questions that you may have. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So again, my name is Trinae Johnson. I am the Associate Director of the Office of Student Financial Assistance at NKU. And I'm here to talk about managing your student account. So first things first, um, you've probably heard this throughout your day so far, but just a quick reminder um, to the student and to the parent um, that the student should be checking their NKU student email address as often as possible because it is the official form of communication from the university. So through to the student's email account, we will send um, items such as tuition bills. Those are sent monthly to the student's email account. Um, the Office of Student Account Services does not um, mail any paper invoices. Those are not generated. So we do um, highly recommend that students check their student email account frequently just so that they can stay up to date in terms of any changes with their account. Additionally, additionally the Office of Student Financial Assistance, we also uh, will send uh, communications to the email account, such as any financial aid information that may be missing. Students can easily access their email account by um, downloading um, the Outlook out app to their phone. And for instructions on that, um, the students can easily do a search um, on the IT uh, webpage um, for those instructions. Um, additionally, the student can contact the IT help desk for assistance with setting up their email account on their smartphone. Um, another quick reminder and another term that I'm sure you uh, may have heard of throughout the day is FERPA. And FERPA essentially stands for the Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Um, essentially, essentially um, this act um, regulates access to students' account information. So all enrolled students' financial information is protected. And um, in order for our offices to be able to discuss account information with the parent or other third party, we do need to have a release on file. Um, and so the student will uh, complete the release form um, with, through the registrar's office website for that. So um, most of the student's business is taken care of um, very easily in the MyNKU portal. Um, through the MyNKU portal, students can uh, have, will have access to view and pay their bill, to view their financial aid status, to view and accept their financial aid, as well as enroll in direct deposit. And I'll talk a little bit about those um, processes um, in a few moments. So this is a quick snapshot of the MyNKU student service site. Um, where, uh, and this particular screenshot shows the uh, accesses in regards to the student's bill. So um, through my NKU, the student can take care of actions such as viewing their billing statement, uh, making a, or, or signing up for direct deposit, um, registering any authorized payers to their account, as well as downloading the tax form, the 1098T, once it becomes available um, at the beginning of the calendar year. So a little bit about viewing the student bill online. Um, once the student um, registers for classes and bills become available, um, the student will be able to access their bill online 24 seven uh, through my NKU. Um, charges um, at the beginning of each academic year, they typically begin to post around mid July. We're now beyond that point. So now at this point, once your student registers for their classes, their billing statement should be available within 24 hours. The billing statement will include charges such as tuition, housing, and other fees. And also just note that um, the fees on the student's bill may change as the students make changes to their um, enrollment um, by adding or dropping classes. So that could also impact the charges on the bill. Um, account statements are emailed to the students. Uh, again, they're emailed to the student's NKU email account. And again, just, just a quick reminder that the an email account is the official form of communication at NKU. So again, just check it often. In regards to bill payment options, um, the easiest option is to make a payment online in the My NKU portable, portal. Um, the forms of payment that are accepted is e-check or electronic check, 
Um, there's no fee, fee associated with um, paying by electronic check. We also accept credit card payment. We accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. With credit card payments, there is a 2.5% fee um, that is assessed with those payments. Um, so we do recommend is when available to uh, utilize the, the e-check payment to avoid any um, additional fees. You can also make payment by mail. Um, you can make payment via check or money order. Um, as always, do not uh, send cash. When mailing in a payment, be sure to include the student's student ID number so that the payment can be properly credited to the correct account. And then payments can also be made in person. Um, check, money order, and cash are accepted with in-person payments. Um, the, for in-person payments, you will go to Student Account Services, which is located on the second floor of the Lucas Administrative Building. Um, also on the second floor, there is a night drop available should the student want, should the student uh, be interested in dropping off a payment after hours. Um, and that drop box is located in, a, in the tunnel between the Lucas Administrative Center and the University Center. Um, and for night drop payments, um, we only accept check or money order. Um, and we ask that you do not put cash in the drop box. And again, with any payment, always be sure to include the student's name and ID number. For the fall semester, the tuition bills are due on August 23rd. So with each semester, bills are always due on the first day of the semester. And we recommend that um, by the first day of the semester, you ensure that 100% of the student's account balance is paid to avoid any additional fees. Accounts that are not paid in full by the first day of classes or August 23rd for this upcoming fall semester will be automatically enrolled in a payment plan. And with the payment plan, there's a $50 installment plan fee. And then additionally, there's a one and a quarter percent account maintenance fee that's assessed on the last day of each month um, that is assessed on any outstanding balance on the account. With the installment plan, um, the installment plan, um, you, the, with the installment plan, the balance is divided into three monthly payments. Um, so for the first payment, if, if your intention at the start is to be enrolled in a payment plan, you'll wanna make sure that at least 50% of the student's balance is paid um, by that date. And then the two remaining payments are due on September 3rd and September 22nd. The second and third payment um, is approximately 25% 20, of the balance that is due on the account. So again, with the installment plan payments, um, the first payment is due on the first day of the term, and that is 50% of the balance owed. The second and third payments represent 25% of the um, outstanding balance on the account. If you are interested in receiving or if you've applied for uh, financial aid, the first step to do so would be to complete the FAFSA or the free application for federal student aid. The FAFSA opens October 1st of every year and the application is available online at studentaid.gov. For this year, students will complete the 2021 through 2022, that's very difficult to say, but the 21 through 2022 FAFSA, um, and with that FAFSA, it, does, it will ask for um, prior year tax information. And for this year's FAFSA, it's asking for the tax information from 2019. So essentially, the FAFSA will ask for tax information for approximately two years back. And that's just to ensure that when it's asking for the tax information that you've already, um, by now, it's reasonably um, believe that you would have completed your tax process um, by this time. When completing the FAFSA, a uh, student and the parent will sign the FAFSA electronically by creating an FSA ID. Um, and in order to create an FSA ID account, um, the student can also do that through studentaid.gov. When completing the FAFSA, students are asked to include the school's code on the FAFSA, and that is to ensure that the school, the school that you intend to receive the FAFSA information will, receive, will receive that information. And our school code is listed here on the screen. It is 009275. 
when completing the FAFSA, you are uh, completing an application to, to be considered for resources such, such as the federal Pell Grant, federal student loans, and if you're a Kentucky resident, you can be considered for the Kentucky CAP grant. With the federal student aid, you do have to complete the FAFSA every year. Your FAFSA information does not roll over for year to year. And that is because your family household information could change, your financial, um, your, your finances and your household could change for year to year. So it's very important that you complete the FAFSA every year to be considered for federal and state aid funds. When you're completing the FAFSA, um, there are times in which additional information may be requested. Um, the application may be selected for what we call verification and additional documentation may be requested, um, which uh, will require that the student take some additional steps to submit those documents, which, which can also be submitted through my NKU. And once you've submitted those documents, we ask that you allow approximately one to two one to two weeks for processing. We do process documents in the order in which they are received. So with verification, just a little bit more on that is approximately one third of all FAFSA or uh, financial aid applications are selected for verification by the US Department of Education. And so when uh, those um, FAFSAs are selected, we are required to request additional documentation um, that documentation could include verification worksheets, a copy of tax return transcripts, and any other documentation as deemed necessary by the financial aid office. One quick note is um, just a two weeks ago, the U.S. Department of Education determined that they will allow some flexibilities with the verification processes. And so as a result of those flexibilities, we were able to waive um, some of the documentation requirements for certain groups of students. If your student um, meets the eligibility criteria, um, your student will can log into my NKU and see that um, any requested documents that are eligible are now waived, as well as the student will also be receiving an email um, from our office just notifying that they qualify for that waiver. With that waiver process, there are some instances in which we may still need some verification documents, and that's just to clarify any conflicting information that's on the FAFSA. Um, but again, if you, if you are um, asked to submit documentation, we do ask that you allow one to two weeks for processing. And then once all documentation has been processed and the application is completed, the student will be awarded with a financial aid package. To view the financial aid package, um, the student can view and accept the awards in my NKU by clicking on the financial aid tab. For students such as your students who are first time users, they will need to view, review and accept the terms and conditions. The terms and conditions on the website will inform the student what their rights and responsibilities are in terms of their student account. Um, so um, that is a, a they are required to accept the terms and conditions prior to moving on to accepting their financial aid awards. Once the student goes on the awards tab, um, that is there is where they can accept and or decline any aid that they wish to receive. And then once those steps have been completed, we, um, we want to point out that you'll need to make sure that you click click on submit as indicated button. It's a, a yellow button that'll be in the lower left side of the screen. So, um, for some students, they may elect to borrow um, federal student loans. So when a student borrows federal student loans for the first time, there are two additional steps that need to be completed in order to finalize the loan borrowing process. Um, those two steps, will be done easily online through studentaid.gov and the student will need to log in with their FSA ID. So it's, a, it's very important that I highlight it is the student's FSA ID that is used to log in to studentaid.gov um, because um, any paperwork or uh, uh, counseling that is done after that point will be under that student's name and we wanna make sure that that happens. So the, the two steps that need to be completed in that process will be loan entrance counseling. Um, and once the student has completed this, they do not have to complete this in subsequent years. It's something that only needs to be completed once. 
Loan entrance counseling is essentially informs the student of their rights and responsibilities of borrowing federal student loans. It also informs them of their repayment options. And there is a section that deals with financial literacy. Just a, a, another step to ensure that um, when a student um, takes um, well thought out and financially fit decisions um, when borrowing federal student aid. Um, so the, that's an important piece of the loan interest counseling process, just to ensure that the student understands um, um, the terms of borrowing federal student loans. And then the second step is to complete the loan agreement, which is essentially the master promissory note. It is the promise to repay any loans that are borrowed. And once the student completes the master promissory note and receives a loan, that promissory note is good for up to 10 years. So just a, a quick note um, in regards to um, estimating, pointing out that you will wanna make sure that you look at the student's billing statement in conjunction with the financial aid just to um, estimate whether or not there will be any out-of-pocket um, cost. Um, this screenshot here, provides a cost comparison for in-state and out-of-state students. Um, and it's really just to point out that in some cases, depending upon the student's financial aid package, um, it, may it may mean that some students may have an additional out-of-pocket expense that is not covered by their financial aid. And there are a couple of options that are available to help cover uh, those expenses as well as their book expenses. Which leads me into conversation about federal direct Parent PLUS loan. So the Federal Direct Parent PLUS loan is a loan that is available for the student's um, biological or adoptive parent, and in some cases, a step parent to borrow in their name to assist the student in financing their education. The application, um, as well as other um, documentation for applying for that loan is available online in the studentaid.gov website. So if you are a parent and you're interested in applying for the Parent PLUS loan, when going onto that website, you would um, use your FSA ID um, when logging into that website to ensure that the paperwork is under your name as opposed to your students. The benefit of the Parent PLUS loan is that it does offer a fixed interest rate. Um, it also um, has an option to defer any payments on the loan until six months after the student either graduates or stops attending at least half time. And the parent has the choice to select that deferment option. With um, the loan, the student can borrow um, up to the student's cost of attendance, less any other financial aid that the student has received. Um, to restate that, to make that more clear, um, each year we, um, we calculate an estimate of what a student's cost is to attend the institution for the academic year. And that, that number represents the maximum amount of financial aid that the student can receive. And so when determining how much can be borrowed in the federal, federal plus parent plus loan, we deduct from that amount any other aid that the student is receiving and the parent can borrow the difference. Step-by-step -step instructions on this process can be found on our, on our website at financialaid.nku.edu. Um, and then as an additional step, um, parents that are approved for the loan and wish to borrow it for the academic year are asked to complete a PLUS loan authorization form. And that must be uh, submitted to our office, Student Financial Assistance. On that form, you as the parent are advising us on how much you want to borrow in the loan and whether or not you want that amount to cover either the fall and or spring semester. So it just really gives us some clarification in terms of how you want that loan applied. That is the purpose of the authorization form. And this screenshot here just gives a quick uh, snapshot of what that form looks like. Um, and again, when completing this form, you'll make sure you'll want to make sure that you uh, submit or fill in the student's name and their ID number, as well as your information. Another option that students have available for them to cover any um, out-of-pocket costs would be uh, alternative loans. Um, these are generally private loans, private educational loans that will be listed in the student's name. 
These loans are, can be available through banks, credit unions, and any other private student loan companies. With these loans, they are based on a credit check. So in most cases, because our students are just now um, uh, graduating from high school and a lot of our students may not have a credit established, um, in many cases, a, a, a incoming freshman student that is completing an al alternative loan application will need a credit worthy co-signer to be approved. We also have additional information on alter on, regarding alternative loans on our website at financialaid.nku.edu. Um, or you can quickly find the information by doing a keyword search on the NKU website using the term fast choice. That's fast choice. So um, with the um, financial aid and ensuring that your financial aid is properly credited to the bill, there's some steps that you'll wanna make sure are completed. So in order to ensure that the student's aid is properly count, accounted for on the, on the bill, you'll wanna make sure that the student has been offered and has accepted their financial aid. Once they've went in to accept and or, and or decline their aid, you'll wanna make sure again that they click the submit button. Um, if this does not happen, the financial aid will may not appear on the bill as an estimate until those steps are completed. Once the, you, so if you look at your student's bill now, after they register for their classes, you may see their aid already showing up as estimated on their bill. Um, and when you see that on the bill, that is an indication that all of the steps have been completed. And any aid that, are, that is estimated on the bill can count towards that 50% requirement that we talked about um, earlier in the presentation regarding ensuring that um, a certain percentage of the student's bill is paid for by the first day of classes. So with estimated aid, it doesn't, it's not actually a true credit to the bill. We actually will not receive the actual funds until approximately um, eight days into, into the semester. So once that date um, comes around, we will receive the actual monies um, from the federal government or from the lending institution. And um, you'll see that the estimated aid will drop off from the bill and then you'll see the actual credits to the bill. If when the aid um, is applied to the bill and if though if your aid exceeds your charges and it creates a credit balance on the account the student will receive a, a refund um, of the credit balance and that typically will occur approximately seven days after the aid is applied so I'll talk about that a little bit more so with credit balance refunds um, essentially it is just excess financial aid or other credits on the account um, for the fall semester, we will begin processing or student account services will begin processing refunds starting Wednesday, September 8th, 2021. Um, direct deposits, and that's for students who are enrolled in direct deposit. Direct deposits are processed every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday um, starting September 8th. Um, once it is processed um, by the student account services office, we ask that you allow 24 to 72 hours for the funds to actually appear in uh, the, the bank account that is on file for direct deposit. So um, a question that parents commonly have about direct deposits is what bank account can be used? Can it be the student's account or can it be the parent's account? It is the student's choice of which account to use as the depositing bank for their, um, for their refunds. So that will be a decision between the student and parent in terms of what account is used for that. And then for those uh, students and parents that do not opt to enroll in direct deposit, we will also issue paper checks. Paper checks are processed once a week on Fridays. And so the first uh, group of paper checks will be processed starting September 10th. Um, all the, while we do offer paper check process, we highly recommend direct deposit because it's easier um, and um, allows for a faster um, processing of or receipt of the student's credit balance. If there's a credit card payment made on the account and that credit card payment um, uh, generates an overpayment or a credit balance on the account, um, rather than issuing a 
refund, the excess funds will actually go back on the credit card. So that step does not have to be um, taken um, in regards to credit card payments. So you may ask, well, if uh, the student is going to be receiving, they won't be re receiving their credit balance refund until September, but they may plan to use any excess funds to pay for their books, how can that happen? So one of the um, options that we have, well, it isn't an option, we automatically provide to the student as a benefit is a book advance. So a book advance will allow for a student to receive um, some of their uh, uh, excess uh, funds on their account upfront to be utilized to help pay for books and any other education expenses that they may, may need to cover prior to the start of the semester. In order to be eligible for a book advance, the student um, must have completed all of their financial aid steps um, and, um, and see their aid um, estimating on their bill and it's viewable on their student account. Um, and you'll recognize that if the billing statement shows that there is a credit balance on the account. The student must also be signed up for a direct deposit and the student um, cannot have any financial holds on the account, which um, your students uh, with this being their first semester, they would not have any financial holds on their account. So with the book advances, uh, again, the, uh, the refund will be processed via direct deposit to the, the bank that's on record. And with the book advances, they are limited to up to $750. So if the student has a credit balance on the account that's less than $750, they will receive that credit. So for example, if there's a $350 credit balance that's shown, currently shown in the account, that's the amount that the student will be receiving as a book advance. If the student's excess amount or credit balance on their account is greater than $750, for example, if it's $2,000, the student will only receive $750 that will be processed on August 16th, and then the remaining amount will be processed um, on September 8th. And with as with any um, direct deposit, we do ask that you allow 24 to 72 hours for the funds to post to your bank. So um, after that se September timeframe, when we begin to initiate um, processing refunds, um, our refunding will happen um, on a weekly basis, whether it be uh, for paper checks or on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, um, if, you, if the student is enrolled in direct deposit. Um, so in general, refunding will occur um, after that point, seven days after the credit appears on the account. And um, the refunds will are based on, or will be processed based on the last payment received to determine the form of refund issue. So if, again, if, the, if there was a credit card payment made on the account, um, the system will make a determination as to whether or not that overpayment will go back on the credit card or, um, if, if not, then it will uh, make a determination as to whether or not the student is enrolled in direct deposit um, and or, or if they um, would be issued a paper check and the dates uh, for those processing are reiterated on the screen here. With financial holds, uh, financial holds are placed on student accounts um, when students have a outstanding balance on their account. Um, so, um, for the fall semester, students will start receiving uh, emails from student account services um, in regards to um, financial warning emails notifying them that they owe more than 50% in their account um, and um, to make a, and advising them to make arrangements with student account services to um, get the balance paid. Um, if the, there is still an outstanding balance on the account of more than 50%, um, classes will begin, um, the institution may begin to start dropping classes for, not, for non-payment um, in early October. So you'll definitely wanna make sure um, if at all possible that you make arrangements for getting the balance paid or that you are um, under uh, meeting the payment re date requirements and the amounts under the payment plan. When a student has a balance that is greater than $100, there's a, also a whole place on the account that will prevent um, registration in any additional classes. Um, and then there may also be a hold on the account that will prevent the student from being able to request an official transcript or receive a diploma. 
when there's an account balance less than $100, there's a hold place on the account that will prevent the student from being able to receive an official transcript or diploma. But we know that um, no one on this in this Zoom meeting will, will be in that situation. So I won't belabor that point. I'll just go ahead and move forward. If your student decides to make any changes to their classes um, that will uh, call, that will allow for a tuition adjustment, there are, um, let me restate that. If your student makes um, enrollment changes to their account with the, um, and are interested in getting a tuition refund, there are certain dates in which that action needs to take place in order to qualify for a tuition refund. So if a, if a student decides to drop uh, one or more classes and receive 100% tuition refund, and that is of the tuition that was assessed on the account, um, they would need to do that on or before August 30th. To be eligible for a 50% tuition refund, the student will need to um, take action to add or drop, to drop the class prior to September 14. After September 14, if the student um, drops a class, um, there would um, not be a tuition refund assessed and they would be uh, fully responsible for the tuition fees for that particular class or classes. One important note I want to mention is that we do have some classes that are, are less than a full semester or a full session. The dates that I have listed here are for full session classes, those classes that will span the entire semester. If your student is enrolled in a class that's a, six, a five week session or a seven week session, um, the dates for tuition refund are abbreviated and they can view um, the registrar website um, and their um, schedule to see what those uh, dates are in terms of uh, tuition refund. So in, in talking about adding and dropping classes, um, just know that if when students add or drop classes, it can, not only can it affect their tuition and fees are assessed, assessed um, it could also result in a student owing a balance. Um, if a student is a uh, financial aid recipient, um, if they are, if they drop a class, we may be required to also adjust their financial aid. So just keep in mind that if, if, if you are adding and dropping classes, it can also impact your financial aid. And so we suggest that the student contacts us um, prior to making um, a decision to drop a class. Um, and, and when I mention this, I mean dropping a class below full time. Most financial aid uh, that is packaged on the student's award is based upon full time enrollment. So when it, if a student drops below full time, which is uh, 12, less than 12 credit hours, it will not only will it impact their tuition, but it will also impact their financial aid. So give us a call if you have any, um, if, you, if you're looking to drop below full-time status, just to see how will it impact your aid. So this is a quick example on how changes to a student's enrollment can impact the bill. So on this particular example on the left side, left side of the screen, um, the student balance is paid in full um, at, at the beginning of fall semester and the student showed a zero tuition balance. And then, um, a, and then a short time after the student dropped classes um, and it was still during the, uh, it, it was beyond the tuition refund period. So the student will still fully assess the tuition cost but we were required to return a portion of the student's financial, of their loans that had credited to their account, which resulted in the student owing a balance of $1,063 to the institution. So this is just a quick example, a very rough example, but a quick example of how um, this, the bill can change very quickly um, is with changes in the enrollment. If a student um, decides to completely withdraw from their university, um, that can also result in a, the student owing a bill um, to the university um, as we may be required to return all or a portion of their funds uh, back to the lender and or the, the source 
uh, for that semester. So again, if a student feels necessary to withdraw from a class or completely from this semester, please have them contact Office of Student Financial Assistance to discuss um, their options. So um, I'm required to go over this, although I know, again, we won't be in this situation, but there are some consequences for allowing for a student balance to go unpaid for, um, for a semester. Uh, one of those ramifications would be that the classes that the students enrolled for will be dropped due to non-payment. Um, and although that happens that the student is dropped from their classes, they may still owe for the tuition for those classes. Um, if the account balance uh, remains outstanding, the account may be turned over to a collection agency. And when that happens, there could be additional fees, uh, upwards of 25 to 33% of the bill that can be added to the balance. Um, and that in turn could have impact on the student's credit score and make it harder to um, receive credit or cr any credit-based loans or decisions. Um, additionally, that, uh, that balance may be turned over to the Kentucky Department of Revenue for collection um, and some of the consequences that they may have is uh, freezing of assets, um, uh, tax refund gar garnishment, wage garnishment, and property liens. Um, for one other point, one other important thing to note is that um, students also have to maintain their eligibility for financial aid by maintaining satisfactory academic progress. So we just wanted to mention this here, just so that the student can be aware that there um, that, that there are certain criteria that have to be um, met, and we review this at the end of each spring to determine if the student is meeting these requirements. So the first requirement is that the student must maintain at least a 2.0 cumulative GPA by the end of spring semester in order to receive federal aid for the, up for the next year. Students are also required to earn and complete at least 67% of the credit hours that they attempt. So what that means is, by example, if a student has attempted 24 credit hours over the fall and spring semesters for a year, they must have completed and earned 17 of those hours during the academic year in order to meet the satisfactory academic progress requirements. And then also, if a, your student is receiving any type of scholarship assistance, uh, particularly with our merit-based scholarships, um, they should also be aware of the requirements that those scholarships may have for renewal. Um, and then um, for our merit-based scholarships, the renewal criteria can be easily found on our um, financial aid website at financialaid.nku.edu um, for further information. If your student is receiving an outside scholarship, um, please ensure that the sponsor um, uh, mails the check or the information to student account services for processing as early as possible. Um, in general, any out, uh, payments that we receive from outside uh, sponsors, those payments are split equally over fall and spring semesters unless the sponsor specifies differently. And then if, you're, if you plan to use a 529 plan to uh, pay towards the bill, you wanna contact the provider as early as possible to give them the payment information <clears throat> and submit any required documents. We suggest that you allow at least two weeks before the tuition due date um, to initiate payment from your 529. And that's to ensure that upon, if the uh, check payment is mailed, it's received by student account services in time before the bill is due. And the same thing for outside scholarships. We highly recommend that you uh, allow at least two weeks um, for the payment to be sent so that it is uh, received on time. For um, any uh, students that we may have that uh, are a veteran or on active duty or dependent of a veteran, um, there are resources available on campus at our Veterans Resource Station. Um, so if, uh, if you um, are uh, eligible for this benefit, make sure that you stop by the resource station um, and get connected to their office. So uh, one of my, the last key points that I wanted to share is in regards to 15 to finish. Um, and that's essentially an initiative to 
uh, kind of help students um, stay on track to graduate within four years. Why that's important is because you can actually uh, realize some cost savings by completing your bachelor degree or your four-year degree in four years versus six. So with students, um, they um, actually need um, at least 120 hours at NKU to graduate. So if you divide that 120 credit hours by four years, that means that the student should reasonably complete approximately 30 credit hours a year. Um, with our uh, full-time tuition, our full-time tuition is a flat rate, whether the student is registered between 12 to 15 credit hours. So what that means is that if a student is enrolled at 15 credit hours, they will essentially be charged the same tuition rate as a student that's being charged 12 credit hours. So if you really think about it, that could in some way, shape or form mean that if a student is taking 15 hours, they're getting a class for free, maybe you can potentially take it that way. Um, and also, um, if the student takes 15 credit hours each semester, they could avoid the cost of extra semesters. So taking the 15, uh, taking 12 credit hours each year, and then you, they may have a semester where they only need, they may need to just take one class when they could have had that class for free. Um, one, important, one important reminder also for those students that are keys scholarship recipients is that um, in regards to 15 to finish is that they can only receive keys monies for eight semesters or within five years of high school graduation. So that's another reason why, at least for those recipients, why it's, it's a good idea to try to finish in four. Um, but um, we know that um, our students will do the best that they can. Um, but as much as possible, we do recommend that the student try to take at least 15 credit hours each semester in order to finish and save money. So to wrap this all up, a couple of tips, just to quickly go over what I shared today is, um, you'll wanna make sure that your student checks their email often, if not daily, and actually read the emails that they receive, um, that you have your student attend, complete, and pass any classes that they take, um, that they should always ask questions and utilize their resources. So if they're thinking about making changes to their registration or enrollment, to be sure that they reach out to their academic advisor um, and or student financial assistance for additional support. We also recommend that if you are interested in receiving financial federal financial aid each year, that you complete the FAFSA each year, and it is available as early as October 1st. And then to always know and remember um, any dates and deadlines um, for each academic year in order to be successful. So um, here on the screen, here's the contact information for both student account services and our office, Student Financial Assistance. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us for Student Financial Assistance. We do meet with students, we answer inquiries. We have web, web chat, uh, virtual meetings, um, in person, as well as um, phone services where, um, so we have various access points where students can contact us with questions. So with that being said, I'm going to stop my share and see how much time I have left and Britta can let me know. I might actually be right on the money. If anybody has any questions. They I tried to answer any questions they had along the way in the chat. Okay. All right. So I see Denise said, woo, this is a lot. Um, Britta, um, is the copy of the presentation, have we given that to you to put on Canvas or should I send that to you? Um, I can get it loaded on Canvas so that students have access to it and they can share that with their families. I'll make myself a note to do that. Okay. So, and Denise, if you, um, if you have any questions, once you kind of digest it all, feel free to contact our offices, or if you have questions about your bill to contact student, student account services. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. I know it was a lot of information and I'm running on, I need some extra caffeine. 
So I should have had that before I started the presentation, but um, thank you for sitting through it with me. And i um, so happy for all of you as you start your journey with NKU or continuing your journey with NKU if you're an alumni. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. And, um, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Trinae. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm the next presenter. Do you all want a stretch break or do you want me to jump right into it? I'm not supposed to start until 5.30. Um, so kind of get a sense for what you all want to do. My information is a little bit lighter than that. Um, so I will start, I'll start with that. Um, anybody object to me just, just getting started and then I'll give you a break before you need to log out of this Zoom link and join that college session link. So if you'll give me just a second to make sure I know how to share the right screen. I've got like three or four screens going on. Um, I'll get my presentation set up. And then we have Kate Goller. She's actually sitting here in the room with me. So hopefully she doesn't start giggling um, while I'm presenting. We're really bad for each other for that. But she, um, Kate is a recent graduate of NKU and she's worked closely with the orientation program as an orientation leader and a head orientation leader. And now she works with me as an intern. And so she's gonna monitor the chat for me. So if you have any questions while I'm presenting, you'll see Kate jump in with some information along the way. And if you have questions that you want a student perspective from, um, Kate just graduated in May. So she is very capable to share her student experience with you all as well. So let me see if I can get my presentation started and we'll, we'll just jump in. All right, I think we are good to go. So my presentation is called Advise, Guide, and Don't Decide. And like I said earlier, I do work in the Office of Admissions. I work really closely with the orientation program. So I get to see your students come in and make this really amazing transition to college. And then I also work with family programs as well. So I like to talk to you all about realistically some of the hurdles that your students may face uh, and then also some of the resources that are available to you all as family members um, and also resources that are available for your student. So you're probably going to hear um, some of what Dr. Howard mentioned echoed in my presentation, um, which to me just means that's probably pretty important information, right? So your students, um, they're coming to NKU, they're going to be in this, this new environment to them, and um, that can feel like really different. So they're, they're learning their way around, um, they're learning how their meal plans work, what professors are expecting of them. Um, so that can be a challenge, um, making new friends and being able to separate their college life from what they had in high school can be another challenge for students. Self-motivation, self-responsibility, learning that expectations um, will potentially change from what they had in high school versus what they have now. And even if they've done, you know, a lot of dual enrollment courses, coming to campus and having that autonomy and um, in a full class load can feel different than, the, than when they took college classes before. And then time management can trip some students up as well. So um, I'm gonna tell a lot of sad but true stories um, along the way here today because that kind of helps me illustrate the points I'm trying to make. But I can very vividly remember going to my own orientation um, too many years ago to share publicly. And my parents were fantastic. Um, they both came with me. Um, I was a first-generation college student, and so they were determined to make the very most of that day on campus. 
my dad sat up in the very front row. Um, he shushed people along the way. He took tons of notes and I was off doing my own thing. And on that day, I felt like I just turned into a full-fledged adult and I joined them at the end of the day and I'm really sassy at that point. And I had a copy of my class schedule and I told my mom that she needed to take my class schedule with her to work to make a copy of it. And she wanted to know why she would need that. And very sassily, I said, well, mom, not all my classes are going to start at the same time anymore. And you're going to need to know when to call and wake me up. And so if we were in person, I would hope that you would laugh at that. Um, but that was a, a big moment for me. And I know that sounds really kind of silly, right? But up until that point, we had a really good thing going. Um, my parents, one of them would just reach in, open the door, flip on my lot each morning, and I would get up, I would go to school, I would make straight A's. It was a good thing, and I expected that to continue in some form or fashion. So really what I was asking my parents to do at the time was to call long distance every morning to wake me up to go to class. And my mom said, no, that is not going to happen. And so on our way home, we had a two and a half hour drive. We stopped at Walmart. My mom bought an alarm clock and she said, you have the rest of the summer to figure this out. And I did. And, and that is such a silly thing now to think of that gave me so much anxiety. But I say that so that you all can think about, you know, what are those little things that maybe your student expects you to continue to play a very active role in and maybe you don't share that same vision. And so what can you do be between now and August 23rd to help them get the ground beneath their feet and to understand that perhaps your expectations are changing a little bit as well. Um, you know, we know for our residential students, sometimes it's learning how to do laundry um, over the summer. Um, laundry on campus is free, so they should be doing their own laundry. Send your laundry here. Let them do your laundry um, if you want to, if you trust them to do that. So, but what are those things? Um, we, we had a student who worked in the bookstore and didn't know how to hang a shirt on a hanger. And so that was a learning opportunity that was probably missed before he got here. Um, but the cool thing is, I think half of what your students are going to learn here, they're going to actually learn outside of the classroom. So that alarm clock, that was a learning moment for me. Um, there's a lot to be gained from sharing a small space with a stranger if your student is living on campus. There's a lot to be learned about how to navigate rush hour traffic when your student is trying to get here and be on time for classes. Um, they're going to gain that knowledge from joining a clever organization, picking up an on-campus job, doing an internship. So they're going to have a really quality experience in the classroom. I have no doubt of that, but I want to make sure that your students capture the full hundred percent. So if they are during that first three weeks of school, if they are constantly home, um, or if they're a residential student and they're constantly texting you, they're homesick, that sort of thing, please push them back to campus to engage with us. We want to spend time with them. There's going to be so much stuff going on in the first three weeks of school that it's going to be hard for them to even go to class and not stumble into some sort of fun activity on the plaza. Um, so we want them to get involved. We want them to get connected because we know that students that do have at least one thing that draws them to campus or creates a relationship between them and NKU that exists outside of the classroom, those students are more likely to be happy. They're more likely to persist. They're more, more likely to graduate in four years. And so we all want that. Um, I also want to say, you know, I know that there are lots of words to describe parents of college students, right? <laughs> um, lots of modes of transportation, vehicles, uh, like hel helicopters, lawnmowers, bulldozers, that sort of thing. I don't prescribe to that. Um, I really see that you all are part of your student success network. Um, if you think about it right now, the invitation for this event went out to about 2,000 parents and you all are here. There's like 18 of you here. And to me, that shows that your student already has a leg up versus you know, another student that maybe did not have a family member come on campus with them for their orientation day or participate virtually. And so please know that at NKU, we view that 
as a partnership. Um, you know, we are obviously limited by FERPA, but we want you all to have the knowledge that you need so that when your student does contact you, you're able to kind of point them in the right direction. So talking about that other 50% just once more, um, time management can be so tricky for a first year college student. And we have found that students that, like I said, if they have something else on their schedule, it tends to help them follow a schedule a little bit more versus a student who has a lot of free time. Um, I know for me having 16 hours that first semester, I thought that meant a lot of time for me to nap. Um, and then I learned I probably should have been using more of that time to study, to work on homework, that sort of thing. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, my first semester of undergraduate was the, the worst semester I've had academically as far as my GPA goes. Um, I didn't drop below like a 3.0. I was able to maintain my scholarship at the time, but it was kind of a rude awakening for me um, in December when I realized how I had performed in the, in the classroom. And so, I say that not to scare you all, but to let you know if your A student reaches out and they say, hey, I got a C on a paper and I've never gotten a C on a paper, that is not completely abnormal, right? That doesn't mean that your student is, is making really poor decisions. It just means they can pause, they can pump the brakes and think about, okay, what do we do to take that C to the next level to get back to what they're used to achieving? Um, but, but time management is key in learning that students who come here and maybe they expect to learn 90% outside of the classroom and 10% in the classroom, that formula is not going to garner success either. So whatever you can do to help them, you know, figure out the proper balance, um, that's really pivotal in that first semester. So we are going to mail you um, a family calendar. Those hopefully will go out in the next couple of weeks or so. And that is a really great resource for you as you support your students. And if for some reason we get to that first day of class and you have not received a calendar from me, you can email me at this parents at nku.edu email address. Give me your mailing address and I'll stick one in the mail. I don't want anybody to not have access to that. It's available on a PDF as a PDF on our website right now, but I want you to have a printed copy of it. Um, I'm pretty proud of that calendar because it's got a lot of information. So I know that Trene just came in and she shared a lot of really important, valuable information. Um, but sitting here tonight, it, I know it has to feel like you've asked for a drink of water and we've just turned a fire hydrant at you. And I recognize too that some of the things that we talk about today you may not need to know that information right away, right? Um, you may not even need to know some of these things until your student is further along in their college experience. So we want you to have access to that at all times. And so, as I had mentioned before, when you, when you are met with a challenge, you can email me and I can help you track down the person you're trying to find or the information that you are looking for. Or if you just need to have a heart to heart because you, like maybe your student is doing great, but you as a family member, you're struggling with this change in dynamic with your student going off to college. So I'm here for you um, as far as that goes. Now the family calendar is gonna have a quick reference guide on it. So when your student needs support and you may not know where to direct them to, the quick reference is going to show you some of the offices that are most commonly used by our first year students. And it's going to provide some bullet points of the services those offices provide, as well as the locations. And so we want you to be able to use that if your student does call you or reach out and they have like a need for tutoring or that sort of thing and you're not quite sure where to direct them. The other thing that the family calendar does is we try to provide you with relevant talking points each month so that you can have um, a meaningful conversation with your student. So in the beginning, I told you, you know, my parents went to orientation and they took fantastic notes. And my dad really latched on to this concept of midterm. Like he knew that was important because so many people must have mentioned it at that program. And I get a call from him in late August. So I'd maybe been on campus two or three weeks at that point. And he's asking me about midterms and I kind of panic a little bit, right? So I'm thinking like, what does he know that I don't? Because that is not on my radar yet. 
I thought maybe I was supposed to sign up for something and I had just missed out. But turns out his asking of that question was just a little bit poorly timed. So if he would have asked me about that in September, early October, I would have answers for him at that time. So the family calendar will help you know sort of maybe the the hurdles your student may be facing at any given point in time so that you're not causing panic like my dad did, but that you're having a conversation that can produce some meaningful results. So hopefully once you get that in the mail, you will use that as you communicate and support um, your student. So we also have a family association. So if you have been receiving emails from NKU at all during your student's college search process, then we have added your email address to this family association listserv. This is a, like a monthly e-newsletter that you would receive. And um, like you may have gotten something from me yesterday about the mask mandate on campus. Um, I really, it's, it, that's literally all it is. The Family Association itself exists virtually and it's just meant to share information with you. So when you get an email and you don't, you're like, I don't wanna be on this list, sir, that's okay. You'll have the option to unsubscribe and you won't hurt anyone's feelings, but it's meant to be a resource for you. So I try to send something out monthly, but then if something important happens in between publication dates and I feel like you need to know that, I will go ahead and pass that information along. So an example, um, over the past year, as the university has made updates related to COVID, I have shared that out on that listserv because a lot of times your students are getting those exact same emails, but they're not reading them. And then that way you can say, hey, you, you may have gotten an email about this. I just, it just came through. Maybe check your email and make sure that you know um, 100% what's going on with that. So if you did not get an email from me yesterday about the mask requirements changing and you want to be sure that you're included on that listserv, you can just email me subscribe to parents at nku.edu and I'll add your email to that listserv. Um, and then again, if we get to that first day of classes and you still haven't heard anything from me, let me know because sometimes those emails will go to like your spam or your clutter, um, but we want you to be able to have access to that. We also exist on Facebook, and so if you like our page on Facebook, um, we have an opportunity for you to dialogue with other family members. So I am a parent. I have two kids at home, um, an 11-year-old and a 5-year-old, which I know is different than having an 18-year-old. I 100% get that. So if you have questions and you really just want to hear from a parent who maybe went through this within the last couple of years, or maybe somebody who's, go, who's going through that at the same exact time as you, you can ask questions on there and we'll step in and um, try to answer those for you. And we also share information on there as well, some of the same information that you would get on the listserv. Now, if you are looking for your big NKU PTA moment, we do have something called the Family Advisory Forum. And this is a group of families that have volunteered to come to campus um, typically, it's every other month, and we meet on Friday evenings. I order dinner for everyone, and we sit and we talk. And so it is not formal. We're not banging gavels or using Robert's rules of order. We're just breaking bread and having a conversation, and we talk about what is working really well for the students, what's maybe not working well for the students, and then I take the feedback of that group to make changes. So when we develop family programming, whether it's the orientation program that you're at right now or an event that we host on campus, that group is my sounding board. That's who I go to for feedback about what they think um, they should hear and how that message should be delivered. And I know that COVID has made things a little bit um, challenging, but they played a really um, big hand in deciding how we shortened the program this summer to allow us to be able to even offer some things in person. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, you can email me at that parent's email account again and just say that you're interested in joining the forum and you fill out like a three minute form just so I know who you are, but we don't turn anyone away. And then you choose how involved or how um, far removed you are from that group. And one of the, my favorite things, I guess, since I've been here is watching that group grow together 
So I like going into these meetings and seeing that the families have connected outside of me being present. And they know they're asking about each other's students. Um, they're forming these friendships that I think will carry beyond their students for years here at NKU. And I also try to figure out, you know, is there a theme? Is there something that that group really wants to know about? So, for example, let's say, you know, things do kind of to stabilize a little bit and you all have not heard anything really about study abroad at this point, right? Because we've got other topics that we need to get through before we get to that point. What I would do for that group is bring someone in from that office so that they could give a presentation and sit down and have a question answer session with that group. So it's also just an additional way for, for that group to learn more information um, that they may have about campus or ask for clarity or raise a concern. And so again, if that sounds interesting to you, just let me know that you want to join and we'll get you signed up for that. Now, currently at NKU, we don't have a family weekend program, but we do something called Family First, which is a series of low cost or no cost opportunities that would bring you to campus to interact with your student in this new environment. So we might do free or discounted tickets to a sporting event for you all, um, you know, discounted theater tickets. There may be a lecture series or some sort of activity going on on campus. And we share those through the listserv and the Facebook page. And you just kind of opt in to the things that are interesting to you. So be on the lookout for those. Um, it can be really nice to get here in October and see that your student feels comfortable on campus. There's something very rewarding about that experience. Um, and one of the funny things that happens is sometimes, you know, I'm at all of these events and I'll see families there without their student. And that just kind of cracks me up. The family wants to have a connection to the university, but the student is maybe off doing something with a club or organization. And so I'm just hanging out with the families um, without the student and that's completely okay as well. But we wanna give you opportunities to come to campus and feel like you're part of, a part of this experience that your student's going through. So switching gears a little bit and just talking about some of the resources that we have available to your students. Um, we have a student success hub here on campus. It's located in this, um, the university center, which is really centrally located. And one of the offices within that building is health counseling and student wellness. So let's say that you have a commuter student and they get to campus and they're just not feeling really great and you're worried about them driving back home they could pop in and get checked out while they're on campus, right? And then you have peace of mind knowing that somebody's looked at them. They don't have a fever. They're probably okay to make it home, that sort of thing. And then we also have students that use um, those services kind of at an elevated level. So for example, if your student um, uses allergy shots and they don't want to have to leave campus to go to the doctor's office to do that, that's a service that they could get moved here so that, you know, they're popping over and getting their allergy shot in between their class while they're already on campus. So just make sure your students know that that's available to them. We also have counseling services. And, and when I talk about that other 50%, um, this is one of the places that I started to gain my 50% in undergrad. Um, I got a call, not about midterms this time, but I got a call from my dad um, pretty early into my fall semester, letting me know that my mom had been diagnosed with cancer. And my mom is, is still to this day my absolute best friend. And so I was pretty devastated by that news. And as an 18 year old, I felt like I needed to just stop out. I needed to drop out. I needed to load things in my car and get back home. And my dad was being very reasonable about it and, you know, trying to gently let me know that I was not needed at home. Um, I'm sure he was, was thinking I would probably be more in the way and my mom would be more worried about me and the fact that I'd stopped out of college to be there with her. But as an 18 year old, that still didn't feel right to me. And that was such a big decision to make. And it caused you know a lot of anxiety, a lot of grief. And so I decided to go visit a counselor in the counseling center. And the counselor at the time helped me learn how to work through that decision. So I decided to stay enrolled. Um, he did help me realize that perhaps I would be more of a worry um, to my mom moving home than, than staying where I was. And so that 
that interaction helps me navigate that particular moment in time. But the skills I learned just from having those continued conversations with a counselor throughout my first semester um, are skills that I use probably every day in the job that I do now as well. So I definitely gained some knowledge um, from that that I have carried with me. So if your student needs to talk to someone, um, you know, whether you already know that they're coming here with that need, or maybe, you know, the first semester just shakes them up a little bit, we want them to know that those um, options are available for them as well. Um, and there's, you know, they're for everyone. There's no no shame in reaching out and asking to talk to someone. So on the flip side of that, we have some academic services that are meant to help your students succeed as well. Um, so I made it to my sophomore year. I get through all the drama of my freshman year. In my sophomore year, I'm enrolled in a statistics course and I have always struggled with math. It is definitely not my strength. And I was struggling with that class. Um, the professor was assigning homework, but he was not taking up the homework. So since that was such a struggle for me, I stopped doing the homework. And then eventually I got so lost in class that I stopped going to class regularly. And so, you know, 19 year old me, if I was in an uncomfortable situation, I tried to remove myself from it. So I stopped going to class, but I did show up long enough to take my first exam and I get the, the exam back and I got an F plus on that test, um, which I don't even think today is a real grade. And so I thought, well, maybe this is a joke. And I'm looking around the room and I can see, you know, the girl next to me seems really excited um, and she was not nearly as devastated as I was. And so I knew that I had messed something up and the professor had written on the exam um, for me to see him after class, which was terrifying um, to read. So I stick around after class and the professor tells me, I know this seems bad. I know this does not feel good. But if you come to my office hours, we'll work through your options. This is just one exam. You need this class for your major. It's a class in a sequence, so you don't necessarily want to get behind. Don't drop the class. So I go back to my room and I call my dad and I tell my dad that this professor has given me an F plus and my dad's super helpful. He wanted the professor's phone number so he could call and have a conversation with him. Um, and I realized that was probably not the best solution. So I hang up the phone with my dad and I dropped the class. Um, I just panicked. I dropped the class. And then I spent the rest of the semester really thinking, you know, do I need to change my major? How far off track was I going to be? And so even that, that moment that should have um, potentially I was seeking instant gratification or relief, it did not play out that way for me at all. So I take the class again the next semester and the professor recognizes me and he said, I told you, you, you didn't need to drop that class. And, you know, I said, well, I panicked. And he said, well, you weren't even coming to class. And I was like, can we just not talk about that? Um, and so, you know, he was ready to help me. And he said, you know, if you would have visited me in my office hours, I could have helped you get connected to a student in the class who was doing really well, because maybe you were not understanding the material the way that I was teaching it but maybe another student could have helped you. And he said, and there's also tutoring. And for me, I thought tutoring was um, expensive. And in high school, that was something that a student would maybe take advantage of in like worst case scenario, like maybe they weren't gonna graduate on time. And so I had never even given um, tutoring a thought. And he let me know that tutoring was free and my mind at that point was kind of blown. Um, and so that is, that's true. That's accurate for your students as well. So things like the math center, the writing center and learning plus, which houses all of these services, those are free for your students to use. Now, those, those services do work a whole lot better earlier in the semester than they do the week before finals, right? So if your student has waited that long and now they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I need to do something. Um, it's not meant to be a Hail Mary, right? <laughs> um, it's meant to be something that they're proactive with. And they don't have to be in my situation where they've gotten this really bad grade. Um, but, you know, we talked about your, your A student gets a C. They can go in and have a conversation with someone and explore some of these options. We also have something called University Connect and Persist, 
which is one of my absolute favorite offices on campus. And they do a lot to help your student um, kind of in a global way. Um, so let's say your student is having a rough go at it and they can't necessarily put their finger on it. They could go meet with somebody from UCAP and they could help them work through what's going on. And maybe they have a conversation and the person in UCAP realizes that your student's stressed because they, they owe money on the bill and so they've started working more or maybe they don't know how to manage a budget or maybe they are doing poorly but they don't know to how, how to navigate a conversation with their professor. UCAP can help with all of that. So in my mind, it's like if your student feels uncomfortable and they're not exactly sure what kind of Band-Aid they need, they could have a conversation starting with UCAP. The flip side of that is if your student is in a class and the professor notices a change, your student's not coming to class anymore, their grades are dropping, um, your talkative student has become withdrawn, they can refer your student to UCAP and then UCAP would reach out to your student to check on them. Now it's still up to your student to make the appointment and go in and actually follow through with that. But I think there's something that feels really nice about knowing that someone on campus has noticed that you may need a little extra support and they care enough to take the time to refer you for that. So that is available. Again, your student can choose to go there on their own or they can be referred there. We also have something on campus called a lending library, which um, UCAP kind of helps out with this. It is located within Steely Library on campus, but your student can go there each semester and potentially borrow one textbook a semester. It's based on availability. So it's something that they would want to check out sooner rather than later, but they take their class schedule and they go and they see if they have a book they can borrow. And what they try to do is if they have multiple books that would benefit your student, they try to give them the one or loan them the one that costs the most. Um, now, that doesn't mean that every semester your, your student will be able to borrow because they may, may not have what your student needs, but there's definitely um, no disadvantage to going and checking it out to see if there is something that they can borrow so that they don't have to purchase or rent that book. And then they just return it at the end of the semester and they see at that time if there's a book that they can borrow for the next semester. Um, so encourage them to take advantage of that. I talk about this a lot, but I still feel like it's one of those little, little hidden gems on campus that your student may not have picked up on. So be sure to share that with them. So your student's gonna receive their all card. Um, maybe they already have, or they'll get it when they come to campus. Um, this is their meal card, their ID card. If they have a PNC bank account, they can link it to that card and use it as a debit card on campus. And it gives them free access to a lot of things. So they can take the area transit for free. They can go to the campus rec center by swapping in with their card. They can go to all of our on-campus athletic events at no cost to them. They can print papers. Um, they can check out library books, that sort of thing. Um, they can also use that to purchase their parking permit. So if your student is bringing a vehicle to campus, they will want to do that. You can go to parking.nku.edu, and I'm sure Kate will put that link in the chat box for you there, and your student can purchase their parking pass, um, and it may still be early enough for parking to mail that parking pass home so that your student can go ahead and hang that in their car, and then they wouldn't have to go to an office to pick that up. So just make sure that they know that they can um, that they can go ahead and purchase that if they need that. I did mention PNC Bank. Um, they do have a kiosk on our campus in the student union. So if a student needs to bank or they do bank with PNC, they'll be able to access that kiosk in a really convenient way to them. So NKU is a pretty safe campus. Um, you know, we're normally one of those schools that ranks highly when um, they do the campus surveys on that. And our three most common crimes are theft, criminal damage, and alcohol. And sometimes one and two are the result of number three. So we are a college campus with, you know, kind of like the standard college crimes. Um, what I would talk about your student regarding this is self-responsibility. 
So if you have a chance to be on campus, um, you'll notice there's a lot of common areas for students to spend time in between classes, after school, whatever. And those those seats are almost at a premium. And so as I walk through the student union and the library, a lot of times those seats are full. And what happens is your students will have their backpacks, they'll leave them in a seat and they'll go to Starbucks, um, they'll go to Steak and Shake, they'll run to the restroom, and they're leaving the potential for somebody to cause a couple thousand dollar heartache, in my opinion, right? So it's very easy for somebody who does not have good intent to walk by, to grab that backpack and keep walking. And at that point, your student um, has textbooks in there. They could have you know, pieces of technology in there, a wallet, that sort of thing. That is a really sad phone call for you to get from your student. So if your student is not used to kind of keeping up with their things, that sort of thing, um, this is a good point in the summer to have a conversation with them about that. I came from a um, rural area when I went to college, and at the time, we didn't necessarily lock our car door or our house door. Um, we, at this point in time, I would, <laughs> that, you know, that place has kind of gotten like everywhere else, but if you're still in that kind of like that little Mayberry kind of feeling area, and your student's not used to doing that, encourage them to make sure they are, you know, locking up after themselves. They're not leaving a laptop in the front seat of their car. Um, just help them avoid these crimes of opportunity. Now, these are not crimes that happen every day, every week, or even every month on campus. But if your student is responsible for that, then they don't have to worry about something like that happening to them at all. Um, so just a quick conversation to make sure that they know that they need to be making some smart decisions when it comes to things like that. And you will get a call at some point or a text. Um, there will be a moment of panic. And it is amazing to me the things that can really upset an 18-year-old, right? Um, so maybe they live on campus and their roommate ate all of their snacks and they're devastated and they think they need to move out or move home. Um, maybe they're driving to campus and their tire blows out and they're afraid they're going to be late for a test. And they're going to call you and they can you know, sound like it is the very worst thing that's ever happening to them. And it may be something like serious and bad, right? But a lot of times it's, it's things that are manageable, but seem like a really big thing to them in the moment. And how you handle that conversation kind of sets the tone for what they learned from that. So we hope that you would be positive and encouraging. Don't necessarily do what my dad did when he wanted to call the professor on my behalf, right? So you want to let your students try to resolve those situations this is that other 50% I keep talking about. And as a parent, I know that's not our natural response, right? As a person, a family member, whether you're a parent or um, your relationship to the student is different than that, you obviously have a strong connection or else you wouldn't be here listening to me tell these crazy stories tonight anyway. So I know that's not our natural response. We want to fix things. We want them to be comfortable. But we hope that you'll consider switching to more of an advising role and recognize that these problem-solving skills are critical to your student's success. Whether they tell you or not, you have to be one of the greatest influences in their lives. So we want you to be positive, supportive, and present. Talk to them regularly, but also give them that space to grow. And the absolute hardest thing that I'm going to challenge you to do is allow your student to fail. That doesn't mean they need to fail a test or fail out um, of college or fail a course but let them be told no. Let them have a moment where something doesn't 100% go their way. We find that a lot of students make it to this point and they've never been told no. Um, they've never had, you know, a really, really hard struggle. And it is so much easier for them to learn how to deal with that in what's almost like an insulated college environment than it is to get out to that first job um, post-graduation and they mess something up, they make a mistake, and then they don't know how to deal with that. So that is a critical skill that we hope that they'll develop here. We don't want them to be miserable or sad or anything like that, but we also want them to know how to interact, you know, in the real world. Know your resources and help guide your students to those. Um, this is the rest of my contact information. Should you need me, I'm happy to help um, 
Again, that parent's email, I check it daily as long as I'm working um, and not home with a sick kid or on vacation. So it's typical that you would hear from me within 24 hours if you need me. Um, hopefully that has been a little bit helpful. I'm gonna stop sharing just so I can make sure there's no questions for me in the chat or if you have anything that you want to unmute and ask, I'm happy to help with that. In the words of Dr. Howard, are y'all feeling good now? I hope, I hope I didn't make it worse, right? Um, so where you're going next is that college session and they are excited to talk to you all about the opportunities that um, your, your students particular college will be able to provide for them as well as some of the expectations. So again, um, lots of good information coming your way. And then we have optional opportunities to visit with um, campus dining and university housing in that seven to eight o'clock hour. So those are two separate links in your email. Um, so if you wanna to talk to one or not the other, just make sure you're clicking on the right words there. Um, and then again, if you need me along the way, please feel free to use me as a resource. Those sessions should open up to you at six. I'm going to stay in here until about 610. So that way, if you have any connectivity issues, you can pop back in here and I'll see what I can do to help you. And a question from Lynn about if you're staying in Northern Terrace, do you need a car? That's a great question. We actually do have a campus shuttle that makes a complete loop around campus and it does have a shuttle stop over at Callahan and Northern Terrace. So your student, that is a personal preference between you and your student. Um, they are located within walking distance from a Kroger. Um, there's an Arby's, a Taco Bell, they're right across the street from a shopping center and they can get to campus um, by foot within 15 minutes. So a lot of times on the map, it seems like they're really far away from main campus, but they're not. Um, we'll have a lot of students um, that live in the area that will bring a bike to campus and they will bike. Okay, do you know how often the shuttle runs? Is it every 20 minutes? Yeah, it's pretty frequent. So 20 to 25 and they get here, they'll learn that shuttle schedule. Schedule, I don't know why I cannot say that word. Um, we're actually gonna mail them a shuttle schedule um, hopefully that'll hit your mailboxes around August 13th um, so they can learn how to take advantage of that. But yeah, it's it's a very visible NKU shuttle bus that runs. Um, it's a weather protected shuttle stop so they're not standing there in the rain, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's totally up to them if they want to bring a car or if they want to take advantage of the resources that already exist on campus to help them get around. Um, is there any way to visit their room before move-in day? Unfortunately, there is not. Um, we have had students and groups on campus all summer, and some of them are still living on campus. And so what's going to get ready to happen is those students are either going to move completely off campus, or maybe they're moving to a different room on campus, and then those rooms have to be cleaned. Um, so they are cleaning rooms right up until move-in day to get those ready for your students. And so um, there's not a lot of opportunity to actually go in and um, see them. So I apologize for that. What activities are scheduled during move-in weekend? Um, we have lots of things going on. It's called Victor Fest. Um, so your students will um, be required to participate in some activities all day on Friday and all day on Saturday. They're like educational sessions, but also meant to, meant to build community. And then every evening, we're going to have optional fun activities for your students. We'll have a hypnotist, um, sporting events, we'll have uh, movies. We're turning the student union into a faux cruise ship where they can do different things on each level of the student union, much like if they were on a cruise ship. So lots of fun things. That schedule is going to be pushed out to them. If you are a family member, we have something called the Boo Hoo Woo Hoo that will take place on move-in day. So whether your student is living on campus or commuting, you can visit us between 10 and 2 p.m. in the upper plaza near the campus bookstore. And we'll have members of the Family Advisory Forum present to offer words of encouragement, a pat on the back, um, anything that you need. We'll have free water bottles that we're handing out to you all. So that's what we have going on for families that first weekend. And then um, we will continue to offer activities to you all closer to September. 
Um, we'll try to get some family first events on the books. Um, so that's kind of what's going on. Um, yeah, honors typically does move in early. And so I would imagine that information is coming really soon. So I would tell him, I would, I would have you all already prepared to move in on the 17th and they'll let you know specifically what time. Um, and as far as I know, there is no limit. Like um, both family members would be able to move him onto campus. If that changes, I'm sure housing will absolutely let you know. But as of right now, um, you should be good to go with that. And then if you're moving in on the traditional moving day, which is the 19th, there's gonna be lots of people on campus that help your students carry all their stuff in. So um, that's a really nice experience as well. So if you're worried about, you know, moving a bunch of heavy stuff, let us get you all moved in on the 19th. So I will not keep you. Um, I want you all to be able to head to your college session so that they don't close their, um, close their event thinking that nobody's coming. But I will hang out here, like I said, in case you can't get connected to that. And then email me if you had a question that I somehow missed. I'm happy to help. Thank you all.